Welcome to the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We are here each week to help you lead more confidently and make a bigger difference, both professionally and personally. This episode is sponsored by 13 Days to Remarkable Leadership, a free leadership video series based on Kevin's book, Remarkable Leadership. Sign up by going to remarkablepodcast.com forward slash 13 days. And now here's your host, Kevin. Welcome everybody to another live episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. You can get all future live episodes and therefore interact with us live and see these sooner. Because see, if you're listening to this podcast in November or later, this conversation is taking place in July. And of course, if you're here with me live, you know that it's July. But if you want to do that in the future, just go to remarkablepodcast.com slash Facebook or remarkablepodcast.com slash LinkedIn. You can get connected and be, and, and be involved with these as they happen. So I'm so glad that you're here. And as you're joining us live, if you're joining us live, uh, feel free to comment along the way while you're here. Imagine that you're just joining us for a cup of coffee. I'll introduce my guests in a second. And just share your questions and your comments and your ideas and let me know where you're um, where you're joining us from as well. And they'll make for a better conversation and eventually a better podcast episode. So connecting your personal philosophy to your work as a leader. And that's our focus today with a guest who's been there, done that and written a book about it. And before I introduce him, let me tell you that today's episode is brought to you by Remarkable Masterclasses. Each month we release a new skill in an advanced masterclass format designed to help you become the remarkable leader and human you were born to be. Details on how to get on board for a specific skill or get discounts each month can be found at Remarkable Masterclass. And with that, I should bring in my guest. His name is Lonnie Main. There you can see him if you're watching us. Um, And let me introduce Lonnie. He is a former technology and turnaround executive who has spent the last 30 years building leadership teams to deliver Red Shoes experiences both inside teams and getting the best out of people using the Red Shoes Living Framework. Lonnie has worked in the best of class companies who believe in standing out for the positive, including Microsoft, Nike, McDonald's, Bose, the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Transamerica, Saks Fifth Avenue, and many more. He is the author of Red Shoes Living, Stand Out for the Positive in How You Work and How You Live. He is an internationally recognized leadership authority and award-winning keynote speaker. He has worked with Olympians, professional athletes, politicians, I'm sorry, um, business executives, military leaders, Fortune 100 executives, uh, entrepreneurs and founders of some of the most progressive companies of our time. His name is Lonnie Main. He's here. Lonnie, welcome. Kevin, so glad thank to you. Have you. Good to be here. Good to be with you and your community. Uh, well, and, and, and I'm pulling you away right now from fishing. Uh, <laughs> you are not at home. You are in Wisconsin and you're yep. fishing. And listen, I'm so glad uh, that you've taken some time out. We've had the chance to put this together. So um, let, let's just start, Lonnie. I always like to when I, I, I guess there's questions I ask at the start pretty much every week and at the end pretty much every week. And this is that first question. I love finding out a little bit more about people's journey because you certainly didn't know when you were a kid that you your life would end up doing and you'd be doing what you're doing. So just briefly, sort of not the not the bio, right? But like, yeah. tell us a little bit about how you ended up doing what you're doing, where you're at today. Yeah, yeah. You know, I my father, so interestingly enough, my father was a professional wrestler, just to throw that out there. And, yeah, it's um, in the book. It's in the book. And it's it's quite a, quite a story. And he was quite a character. Um, I talk a little bit about him in that book. And he passed away when I was 10 years old. And his brother was a CEO and executive. And so after my father passed away, my uncle uh, would take me with him on business trips and we would travel every summer. And so I really got to see kind of the, the, the professional wrestling world before my father passed away and how he treated people and his fans and kind of what that was all about. And after he passed, I got to see my uncle, who was a turnaround executive himself and leader and watched him and how he treated people and really embraced, you know, people as human beings first and employees second. And I learned a lot from him in, when I was traveling and I uh, went to college, came out of college and went straight into corporate America doing mergers and acquisitions. And I learned pretty quickly that all those things that I had been taught by my father and my 
uh, uncle applied in the world that I was now in. And I was watching great leaders really run past the human side and kind of crushing the human spirit during these mergers and acquisitions as you bring two companies together and create what I call compression and fear. And so early on in my career, I was the one that kind of came back in to the individuals and try to reignite the spirit of the human being and bring the person back. And that's what created Red Shoes Living. We didn't call it Red Shoes Living back then. It wasn't until I got to the technology company that I ran where we actually called it Red Shoes Living. And there's a story behind that. But the premise of it was, is if we can keep the human spirit alive in business, we spend more than half of our life, you know, in our careers every day, um, then we can ignite human potential. And um, and that's that's hard work as a leader because you really have to spend a lot of time doing that. So that's where this all came from. And 30 years later, it's more important today than it was, you know, back then. Yeah, we're going to get to those five components. But people are wondering, you know, I have to tell you, when I first saw the book title, it showed up and, you know, and and, and we said it, we were you pitched us and I said, we'll take a look. And I heard Red Shoes Living and I thought it's going to be a a female that wore red stilettos or something. <laughs> right. and, then, and, and it's Lonnie. So that could be a woman like that's where, until I started reading I'm like, yeah. okay, well clearly <laughs> yeah. this is a woman. This is not a woman. So here's the question. Why red shoes? You did talk about it in the book. Yeah, no, this is a great, quickly, why is that the metaphor? Great question. So when I left corporate and went to the technology world, my children said, dad, you can't wear the suit and tie in tech. You've actually got to look cool. You got to wear a black t-shirt and a hoodie and a pair of jeans. And they bought me a pair of red van tennis shoes. And so I was addressing our small technology team at the time, and I was talking about this concept without calling it Red Shoes Living and just saying, look, we're going to stand out for the positive in everything we do, from how we onboard people to how we you know, uh, meet with our customers to how we email people. Literally everything we do, we want to stand out for the positive. And I was giving some examples of that. And after about 30 minutes of me just going off about it, our head of marketing looked down and he said, you know, I get it, Lonnie. You want to stand out just like those red shoes stand out that you're wearing. And I said, that's right. And it just became the reminder. That became the symbol for how we wanted to show up in business and in life. Well, you know, it's I love that story. And that's what, one of the reasons I wanted to share it because, you know, having a, you know, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, having, uh, coming up with metaphors, coming up with visuals, very, very helpful. And, and but when they come, when they happen, organically, when they happen from real life, I think they're more powerful. And so I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. glad you share that. So uh, this red shoes living approach, this framework has five basic components. Yeah. And so uh, I don't, we probably don't have time to dive into all five in great depth. I've got some I want us to talk about, but just quickly talk about the five. Yeah. Give us the, give us the outline. So the framework, <clears throat> the first one is um, awareness. It, you know, everything starts with awareness. That's kind of the gateway to everything we do. And gratitude is the second one. Um, kindness and respect. Uh, everybody has a story, understanding you know, how we connect with people, and then um, putting yourself out there is, is the final one, which is the action behind this. And the, the, the simple philosophy is really the title of the book, Stand Out for the Positive and How You Work and, and How You Live. What made it popular is people could identify with that in a personal way. They could make it their own. So my red shoes is maybe a little different, Kevin, than your red shoes version in terms of how you show up. And then the mindset was a question that we would ask ourselves every day. And I asked this multiple times, is what I am about to do red shoes? In other words, will it stand out for the positive? So even in this podcast with you, you know, I'm using all five of those pillars, hopefully by the end and through the podcast to create a red shoes experience for you and your audience. Um, an experience that stands out. So that that's really the premise. And then the framework gets applied in four key areas, leadership, um, the, the culture of a company, the customer experience, and then how one lives their life. So me being here on this fishing retreat is a version of red shoes for me, you know, just being with good people and standing out for the positive and sharing and learning from each other. And, and so we can take it into our personal lives as well. And that's sort of what I said to start was the connection between um, yeah. our how we well, it's in the title again, how we work and how we live. Um, so, you know, zero disrespect to gratitude, respect and kindness, because they're absolutely critical 100 percent. And yet I think that people pretty much know what those are, uh, probably have a pretty good sense about even about awareness. But the other two is really where I want us to spend time, not because they're necessarily more important, but because I think they're um, maybe you can bring greater clarity to why they fit in yeah. your framework. And the first one is uh, of those two that I want us to talk about is everyone has a story. So, 
okay, we can all say intellectually say, yep, everyone's got a story. Why does that, how does that fit into your approach to life and your approach to, to leading in business? Yeah, great question. It's more, this, this pillar, if you will, is more important today than it's ever been, just simply because of everything that we've, you know, all gone through around the globe. Um, but connecting with somebody's story, our stories change for the day. And in business, you know, business gets very loud and noisy as we are operating daily with KPIs and metrics and trying to hit our numbers and our EBITDA targets and all of these things, which are critically, critically important to running a business. But at the end of the day, if we're not connecting with our people and their stories, then we don't know how to inspire them or become their advocates and, and or support them in something that they're going through, you know, in a difficult time. So as we've been going through these difficult times with remote, you know, workforces, the stories that I have heard every single day from clients that I work with and other people that are going through personal challenges. And now they're, you know, they're also working remote and all the things that we've heard with their children, you know, being in and out of school and home. As those stories change as leaders, we really have to connect with them. And just a, a simple concept that I talk about in the book, we call this tapping into the 20%. Meaning that if if 80% of who we are are the things that we do every day, we put gas in our car, we do our laundry, we eat food, we you know, all the stuff, we take our children to school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's this 20% inside of us that is our deepest desires, aspirations, you know, our goals. It's who who we are, what makes us us. If I can connect with what's in your 20, Kevin, then I know again how to inspire you, become your advocate, and support you. So one of the things we talk about is you have to understand the story. If you run past the story, you're running past the human spirit. You're running past the very essence of who that person is. You know, a couple of things about that. First of all, is it the, at the early, early in the pandemic, mm-hmm. um, I, I started saying, making the statement that said, we are all having the same experience, but experiencing it differently. Because I was working with leaders yeah. who, you know, maybe they are like me and their kids aren't, you know, they don't have kids at home. Uh, and maybe yeah. others are dealing with this or dealing with that. And some are more worried about the virus itself because of other issues th- than others might be. Like everyone's situation was different. And so I love this way of this way of thinking of everyone has a story as a very um, easy way mm-hmm. to get at being empathetic. Absolutely. Right, which yeah. is what you really fundamentally said at the very beginning of you describing it was like, how, how can I, I, I can't really connect with people deeply if, if they don't feel heard and understood. And I think saying it this way is sort of a very um, approachable way to get at that idea. And right. I really, really, really love that. Right. Yeah. And when those, when those five, I know we're focused on the two, but when those five kind of all come together, you increase your awareness that you need to understand somebody's story. Even as I was listening to you before we went on the air, we were sharing our stories. You know, we we're talking about your farm and some other things, you know, that you do. And that's how we connect. And so immediately as, as a leader, I'm thinking, OK, he's got two children. He's got a farm. That's probably in his 20. Those are things that are in his 20. Or for me right now, being with you know, friends, family and other down here fishing, that's in my 20. That's important to me at this very moment. So those that work with me know, let's support Lonnie so he can fish and let's support Lonnie so he can get on Kevin's you know, podcast, et cetera. Right. right. Well, you know, I, I was struck when I read What's Your 20? Because first of all, that reminded me I'm old. So it reminded me of uh, in CB lingo, that's like, what's your location? So I thought maybe that's where you were headed. And then I realized, no, Kevin, you're just too old. But why that even came to me, I don't know. But but the thing that I, I, I love what you said about that, but I also think that um, for some people, they would say, well, my daily activities and my work and all that stuff, it's more than 80. I don't even have 20 left. And that in itself is a lesson for us. Um, But I also like the idea of not only what knowing my 20, to use your language, Mm -hmm. but understanding that for others. So I have, you know, on my team, I have a member of my team, hi, Adrian, who is a huge Virginia Tech football fan because she went to Virginia Tech, met her husband there. They are huge Virginia Tech college football fans. That's in her 20. Now, I know a lot more about what's in her 20 than that. But the point is, the reason I use that example is, I mean, a lot of people that care about Mm -hmm. their college alma mater or whatever. For Adrian, it's more than that, Mm -hmm. right? And so Knowing, knowing people's rooting interests as a leader or as anyone else is part of their story, but really knowing if it's in their 20 is a whole other level. 
Mm -hmm. And it, uh, to your point, what I love about the, the concept of the, the tapping into the 20 is that we can share what's you know important for us at any given time so other people, again, know how to support us, and then they can do that in return. But we can ask the question that becomes a language. You know, um, Nancy, who I work with, uh, will ask me quite often, Lonnie, what's in your 20 today? Or what's in your 20 this week? Or what's in your 20 this year? So we have a dialogue. And, and in fact, if I am doing something that is outside of my 20, um, she'll, she'll call me on that sometimes say, why are you doing that? That's not even the, the focus. That's not your 20, you know, you should be completely focused on Kevin's podcast right now and not on something else. Right. So it becomes a language. They're catching all the fish and I'm in here <laughs> talking to Kevin. Um, so the other one of the five, obviously gratitude, you know, which yeah. connects to all of that. I mean, like when we are, when we have that gracious gratitude spirit, yeah. it makes it easier for us to reach out to someone else's story. And once we know their story, we're more grateful. Uh, I, I can't imagine we wouldn't be uh, yeah. as a result. But the, the fifth one, the top of the the top of the pyramid, as you wrote about it in the book, is this one, put yourself out there. And again, worth giving us a little more background about what this one means yeah. to you. You know, when we think about when we were younger, when we were children, we really had no fear. Most of us, you know, we if we were in school, in elementary school, we raised our hand and asked the question or we would shout things out without raising our hands. And, you know, we, we believed we were Superman and Superwomen, that we could actually fly and that, you know, we had all of these great things. And along the way, as we, we get older, we start to pull back a little bit. We hesitate a little bit. And for, for good reasons. I mean, we learn that we can't just shout things out. We do have to raise our hand. But when I speak at conferences, I'll use the example of, you know, we used to sit on the front row. We used, we used to be engaged, but now we tend to sit on the back row and we tend to pull ourselves back. So putting yourself out there was a reminder in business, in our lives, to do the things that are important to us, to take the shot, to take the risk. Now, to do that in business, you have to have an environment and a culture that's safe and that supports that, which is part of Red Shoes as well as creating that so people can put themselves out there, come up with new innovative ideas and new suggestions and even challenge respectfully to things maybe that are being done and maybe there's a better way to do them. So, you know, in hiring leaders, we want leaders that put themselves out there, that, that take the risk. And that, that can be a new leader coming into business or a legacy leader that's been around a long time. We just don't want people to get comfortable and still. We want that human spirit to continue to put itself out there in life and in business. Yeah. You know, you, you keep saying this phrase. I'm writing it down here for my notes. Uh, the human spirit. Yeah. And, you know, this is a leadership podcast. Um and yet we're all humans. Right. And so, and in fact, as leaders, we're all wearing, we wear lots of hats in our lives, but as leaders, we wear two hats every day. We wear the leadership hat and we wear the teammate hat, right? We're on multiple teams. Right. Um, and so we have to, we have to bring ourselves to work as well. This isn't just about what we're supposed to do for others. Uh, talk to me about what you've learned about how to rekindle the hum your human spirit as a leader specifically. Yeah. yeah, it goes back to when we were doing mergers and acquisitions and when we would you know, bring two companies and their cultures together, it's like bringing two different families together, right? That have different sets of values and, and everything. And it was then that I, I noticed how much I had learned from mentors in the past mm -hmm. when I got to that point, because the leadership team in one specific example was running past the human spirit. You know, we had brought two companies together, which means a lot of times people get let go that creates compression that creates kind of an unsafe culture and then we were standing up in front of these these many people saying now we want you to trust us and you could literally see people just kind of duck down you know like ah, this all just happened and why why should i trust you so it was reaching back in and tapping into the 20. That's where some of these concepts came up. And so we said, we have to be empathetic, compassionate. We have to care as much as we want to just push people, you know, with a paycheck and the opportunities and benefits. You can't just do that. We, you have to reach inside where it's appropriate and keep the human spirit alive. Because if you can do that, then you can really facilitate flight for people. So. I, you know, I started to learn that and slowed down. And I remember where all that came from as I was watching my mentors do that and it's never changed and you know going through covid um i was on the uh, phone with an executive just uh right before the weekend and we were chatting about what was in his 20. and the investors that he was working with um they were kind of pushing him on a couple of things and i asked him the question do you know what's in their 20. 
what's important to them? Well, we know what's important to you, but do you know what's important to the investors and in their 20 professionally? And he couldn't answer the question. And so this week, what he's doing is jumping back in and saying, all right, this is what's important to me, but to be respectful and fair, I need to understand what's important to you. And immediately when we do these things, people feel seen. We're putting the human factor back into it. And then we're coming together and saying, all right, let's 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 walk down this path, you know, collectively um, side by side. You know, that, that's that's really awesome. I mean, that I mean, that that's the that's the whole connection, connecting this to customer service and all this, the rest right. of it. But you know, there's an interesting point that I'll make here, and that is that a lot of times leaders are afraid to ask a question when they don't have an answer. Yeah. Right. Uh, and they're they're scared and they're worried about that. So if you're sitting out there watching us or listening to us, um, and and you're saying, well, I, I don't want know how to, I don't know how to get in to try to understand people's twenty, or even if I do, what if I don't like connect with any of their stuff? Right, doesn't matter. Your point is they feel seen, and mm -hmm. as a leader, when 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 our leader lets us feel seen, acknowledges us. Yeah. It's huge. It's, it's huge. We, we, un, we underestimate it as leaders because we look in the mirror every morning and say, oh, that's just Kevin. And mm -hmm. then we go do our thing. And we, we, we forget that this power differential is real and, yeah. and it matters to people. Yeah. yeah. And you bring up a point that I've seen, you know, through COVID, we've seen a real openness and vulnerability with leaders where, you know, we're, we're having different discussions today than we did. 16, 17 months ago. Yeah. Hopefully. Not yeah. always, but many times. Right, right. And I and I'm seeing, you know, uh in, in my world, and I'm sure you're seeing this too, where leaders are coming together and we're starting to share things. You know, um another executive that I was working with, you know, said to me the other day, he put himself out there and just said, you know what, I'm just my mental health, I'm just I just need time off. I, it's too much. I can't because this work is hard too. When you're tapping into the 20 and trying to keep the human spirit alive, you have to take care of yourself as a leader as well. The aware, that's where awareness kicks back in. You have to get good rest. You know, you have to eat well, whatever the exercise routine you may have. It's all of that stuff we have to do to recharge ourselves as we're going to be a red shoes leader to the people that we work with and work for. And this, uh, this leader was tired. And so we talked about that. We said, you know, thank, I said, thank you for putting yourself out there and telling me that vulnerability that you're tired and kind of mental health is, is challenged. What are we going to do about that? You're 20 now is, is your mental health. So let's get you on vacation or more time with your children and let's get your team. And that's the other thing that happens, Kevin, is when you create that environment, that leader can step out of that business and the other leadership will step in and put themselves out there in support of what he's doing. And so that's part of how this Red Shoes culture works. Um self-care isn't selfless everybody i mean isn't yeah. selfish excuse me self-care isn't selfish we've got to take care of ourselves we can't be at our best for our team we're not taking care of ourselves so i i know i know lonnie that pretty much everything you know you've encapsulated a lot of your lessons and a lot of your uh learning inside of this yeah. model that you've created red shoes living red shoes experience but i'm going to ask a question that sort of says beyond the framework and I know that it's pretty all encompassing, but beyond that, as a person who was a leader for many years, right? Yeah. Um, what's a big lesson you learned as a leader that maybe goes beyond some of the things that we've talked about here? What would be something else maybe that you would impart? To yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to point back to an experience I had right before I left the technology company to really write the book and to do this full time. I was sitting in a meeting of people that I had tremendous love and respect for that I'd worked for for a lot, worked with and for for a long time. And we we were in a meeting where we had a vendor partner of ours that was there that day. And the work that we were doing together for the vendor partner was not really working all that well for him. And so I was challenging our team that we needed to be doing more for him. And in that moment, I was watching the emotion of, of my team. Um, they were getting a little emotional about the words I was using. So the power of words, number one, is one thing that I've really learned. But in that moment, I took a pause and I said, I can tell maybe we need a break here for just a minute. And we had probably 12 people in the room. And I asked uh, three people to stay back and everybody took a break. And I talked to the three people and I said, I am aware that the words I am using, there's an emotion that's coming back to me from you. Talk to me. What what am I saying? And our head of marketing at the time said, Lonnie, you keep saying, you know, we're not doing enough. The reality is, is we've done so much. It may not be working and having an impact, but we don't want to disappoint you. You know, we feel like we're disappointing our dad, which made me feel really old, by the way. <laughs> 
But what I what I learned, I was the red shoes guy. You know, my level of awareness and connectivity on the human side should have been at the highest level. But I had let the noise of, of business get so loud that I was running right past the very essence of what I talk about. So I sat there with them and I and I apologized and I said, you know, this is a great example of where I'm at with Red Shoes Living on a scale from one to 10. If 10 is the ultimate creating Red Shoes experiences of being a Red Shoes leader, I should be a nine and a 10 consistently. And I'm a seven and maybe my seven is better than most people's tens, but I've got a lot to learn here. And it was interesting to have the conversation with the team. And I said, you know, from now on, I'm going to make sure in a meeting, I'm going to be aware and say, this is my stated objective. And have I achieved that at the end? And if I haven't, then you tell me. So it was creating that space. So to answer your question directly, it's our awareness can drift to the left and drift to the right. You said it earlier, we're human beings. So the noise of our personal lives gets a little loud sometimes. The noise of a pandemic gets a little loud. The noise of business, you know, so it's just that's probably the number one thing is because it all goes back to what I call the gateway, which is awareness. Awareness if I'm talking too much. Awareness if I'm not taking care of myself. Aware if I'm not listening enough. So that would be the biggest one for me. It's beautiful. So there's a there, there's a number of stories in the book. You talk about a lot of people. And yeah. uh, I'm just going to put a name on the screen, and I'll say it for the people that are only watching. And I just want you to tell me whatever you want me to tell you about what you learned from this person. All right. Okay. His name is Scott Donnelly. What would you learn oh, from yeah. Scott? Scott was a West Point grad, and um, I learned a lot from Scott. Scott would, a couple things really quick, always answered his phone unless he was on the phone with the client. He was always very, I was always impressed with that. Um, treated back, back when people didn't have one in their pocket, and yet they still figured out how right. to answer it. That's right. That's right. He just knew how to connect. He made himself available. He expected the best out of you. You know, he held you accountable, but also treated you with kindness and respect. Um, one of the things though he did for me, and he did this multiple times is he figured out what was in my 20 and I write about this in the book. And I, it, there was a time in my life when I was traveling quite a bit and, and I was younger and I, you know, had young children and all I wanted to do was build this play set in my backyard, one of those wooden swing sets. And I could not, I couldn't get to it. I just didn't have the time. And so Scott had figured out that that was part of my 20 or spending quality time with my children. And he, he basically put together uh, that entire situation to happen for me. And I showed up after a business trip. It was at night. My wife said, you need to go out and look in the backyard. And I had an entire play set up that was built by Mr. Scott Donnelly. And another time he sent me and my family um, to Disneyland over the weekend, you know, and, and these were big things. And I want to make a point. You know, understanding somebody and what's in their 20s it doesn't have to be a big thing. You don't have to do a big gesture. It's just sometimes acknowledging what's important to them at that time. But he he was just one of the most kind, respectful leaders that I've ever worked for and, you know, continues to be an amazing individual and a great example to me. I, I, I just, I, it's one of my favorite parts of the book, and I wanted you to share that. But and, and I didn't even make this connection until as you were saying it. So, you know. There are a lot of leaders out there saying, I can't go put up a play yeah. set or I can't write the check to send my right. person to Disneyland. But I'll give you an example of something that happened to me when I was a young employee that cost my leader nothing, but gained him everything, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, and that is, so I went to Purdue. I'm a huge Purdue fan in general, Purdue basketball specifically. And um, I was promoted to San Francisco along with, this is back before, you know, you could watch any games you wanted to watch from wherever you wanted to watch them. So I spent the entire season watching maybe two or three Purdue basketball games and uh, NCAA tournament time starts. And my boss comes into me on a Wednesday and says, you're not coming to work in the morning. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, is there a pink slip involved? He says, you're not coming to work in the morning. The Purdue game, this is, we're in the, I was on the West Coast. The Purdue game tips at 920. You are to be watching that game. You are to call us at halftime with an mm-hmm. update. You are to call us when the game is over. And then you go get on BART and come to, come to the office. Yep, that's it. That cost him nothing. Yep. Nothing. And, and it's, yeah. And Kevin, I'm glad you brought that example up because it, it can be a handwritten note of acknowledgement of something great that you did. You know, I always ask people, when's the last time you've received a handwritten note, not a text, you know, not an email, but a handwritten note of thanks. And I, I will tell you, too, the most powerful Red Shoes leaders that I've worked around are the quiet ones. It's not always the ones that are doing the big grand gestures. They're doing quietly seeing you, you know, and, and acknowledging you. And so I, I love that story. It doesn't have to be a big thing to make an impact. 
You know, I've, I've been recently asking people, so do you have a file of all of those little notes and letters? And you know what? About 80% yep. of people have one. And then they'll say, yeah. And when I'm having a bad day, I go back and read them. That's, I do the same thing. In fact, on my credenza um, in my house, I have put note cards out in the open. I used to file them. I kind of keep them back. And now I put them out in the open. I walk by them every day. And there's just something about that, the appreciation of people seeing me and acknowledging me, you know. And so, yeah, it's a great reminder. Absolutely. Uh, I'm going to shift gears. Okay. Um, I guess in a way, I've been asking this question of, of folks on this show for a long time. And I'm going to, the, normally the question I ask is, what do you do for fun? I guess I could still ask that, but I could say, like, what's in your 20? Yeah, um, that's great. <laughs> either, way, either way you want to answer it, go ahead. Yeah, well, clearly the work I do, I call it the mission. You know, Red Shoes Living is in my 20. I love what I do, just like you do, and sharing, you know, the concepts of Red Shoes Living. My children are obviously in my 20. I have four. They're all older now, so they're, they're trying to keep their dad young. Um, and then I would tell you my health right now, what's in my 20 is my health, just going through everything that we did. And so I get outside a lot. I mountain bike and, you know, in the wintertime I ski and, and that's important to me because I really believe that it transfers back out, um, to the work that I do. And so that's pretty, pretty much what's in my 20 sharing this message as far as I can, you know, uh, far and wide as I can share it, turning the negative noise down you know, doing the right things. I mean, these very, very basic concepts. And, and the other thing I want to share with that, when you start to share what's in your 20 to the people that you work with, they start to support you in that, which is a beautiful thing because there are days that I'm that are tough for me where somebody will step in and say, hey, I know this is in your 20 and I want to support you. I want to buy you the tickets. I want to, you know, do whatever the case I can for you. Yeah. yeah. Um, a question I ask everybody and the only question you knew I was going to ask you, Lonnie, what are you what are you reading these days? <laughs> you know, I listen to a lot of audiobooks, so I had to actually look. And I, I will bounce back and forth. But the two, The Inner Gym by Light Watkins. I've been spending a lot of time on mindset lately. There's a lot I could talk about and share with some science and research that we've discovered there. And then the other book is Walk Through This by Sarah Schulting Kranz. Uh, it's another book that I'm reading and phenomenal book. Um, two different types of, of books, both kind of on leadership and getting through difficult times. And um, But I love to read. I love to be inclusive. I love to share and borrow. You know, uh, I, Red Shoes Living specifically today is what it is, not because of me, but because of those that embrace the concept of it and make it their own. And then I get to learn from your version of Red Shoes Living or somebody yeah. else's. And so that's one of the things that, you know, in terms of reading and I consume and, you know, I love all the work that you're doing and everybody else is doing out there because it makes us all better. And oh, by the way, just for everyone's knowledge, reading by listening is still reading. I mean, it's still, <laughs> Thank it's you. still learning from the book. So, um, so now the question you've probably been wanting me to ask, like, where can people learn more, Lonnie? Where can they learn more about you and your work and the book? Where do you want to point people? Yeah, so LonnieMain.com or RedShoesLiving.com, uh, those, those websites there. Uh, please go there. You know, we're updating content in there all the time. And um, yeah, that's the the best place. We're clearly on LinkedIn and Instagram under Lonnie Main and all the social media pieces as well. So yeah, and Nancy Doan, you've got Nancy on there. She's our chief yeah. of staff and she's an incredible human being. One of the best examples of the Red Shoes Living concept that you'll ever meet and engage with. See, I didn't even know. I'm just putting it up there because she's read the book and it's <laughs> one of your it's really, oh, yes. Yeah. It's someone in your circle, right? We tend to um, read the same books. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so now I have a question before we before we finish, everybody, I have a question for all of you. And it's the most important question of the last 33 minutes. And here it is. Now what? What are you going to do with this? Maybe you need to think about how you can turn down the negative noise. Maybe you need to think about tapping into your 20 or challenge yourself to understand the 20 percent of your team members. Maybe um, you need to ask yourself that mindset question is, is what I'm about to do uh, red shoes? And, and so whatever it might be, those are just a few of the things. Maybe you need to remind yourself to go back and sit on the front row and sit on the edge of your seat. I don't know what it is. Those are just a few things that I wrote down that I, that I took from our conversation. And so my challenge to you is to say, what are you going to do with this? Being, being engaged and listening, we appreciate, Lonnie and I both appreciate. If you enjoyed it, found it useful and valuable, great. None of that matters unless you take action. And I think we both hope that you do exactly that. So um, thank you so much, Lonnie, for being here. It was an absolute pleasure to have you. Kevin, thank you. My pleasure. Before we go, everybody, today's episode was brought to you by... 
remarkable master classes each month. We release a new skill in an advanced form of master class format designed to help you become the leader and human you were born to be. There you heard it again. Life and work. Uh, details on how to get on board for a specific skill or how to get discounts each month can be found at remarkablemasterclass.com. And with that reminder, we're done for another week. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Remarkable Leadership Podcast. We'll see you, everybody. Thanks.